I mentioned, welcome to the Restoration Road, where today's guest is Anthony Pons. As a young man, Anthony found himself in a do or die situation. And as God would have it, that has become a theme for him on how he responds to the grace of God. You will not want to miss the story of do or die with Anthony Pons. Anthony, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you. It's a pleasure. I love hanging out with you. Um, I've learned a lot about your story and I'm eager for everyone else to hear it. Um, can you describe what growing up was like for you? Initially in my early childhood, I uh, grew up in a foster home. Um, the foster home was very much so Christian. Um, we, everything was church. Church, we were the first ones there, the last ones to leave. Um, but soon after, when I was around nine years old, um, my mom got me back out of the foster home. Um, when, I, when she moved to Florida, and then she got me back, so I moved from Wisconsin, where I was born, to Florida. There's a little bit of change in weather. Oh, yeah. Um, and going back to my mom's house, that was so far from God, anything far from God. Um, never went to church, which actually suited me because I was tired of church. I was churched out. Um, but the lifestyle in the, in the household that I was raised in in that moment uh, was not me. The drugs, the alcohol, um, the partying, and so everything I did, I ran to school. Um, I, I, everything I wanted was at school. And so I had this worn within me because my grandparents were in my life. They were heavily involved and they were Christian of a drug infested, you know, alcohol environment, but still that's not who I was. Are so, these uh, grandparents your mom's parents? Yes. Okay. So they uh, provided a Christian environment and, and I'm gathering what you're saying is your mom rebelled against that. Oh yeah. Okay. Absolutely. And that has to do with why you ended up in foster care? Yep. With, through Absolutely. her use of drugs and alcohol? Mm -hmm. Okay. So though I was in that environment, um, I grew up not really fitting into to doing that. That's why everything I did, I ran to school and I got involved in sports, student government, um, and everything, every, every aspect that, that came with middle school, high school, and then on to college. Now, it's obvious to see that uh, you're an athlete, and so you were one then as well. Um, were you pursuing athletics and sports in a way that you didn't want to drink um, or do drugs, or were you kind of mixing the two together? Actually, that, that school in athletics and sports was the thing that kept me away from doing drugs. Mm. Um, I, very same thing in high school and middle school. I had both sets of friends. I had the street friends, and then I had the, the jock high school football player athletic friends. And because we were involved in athletics, we never wanted to participate in the same things that they were, even though we knew them and we were around them. So our, my athletic career and my involvement in school is the very thing that actually kept me away from um, drugs, drinking, smoking, any of that while I was in middle school and high school. Mm. Well, uh, you are a great football player. What position? Running back. Running back, you look Keep like a running turn. back. Um, <laughs> I suppose you ran a lot to the house on the kick returns? Yes, I probably averaged one to two a game. Are you kidding? Yeah. Oh my goodness. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, you were, what, what events in track? I did in I, 100, four by one, long jump, and um, 400, which was my Oh, 400 with you? Like, not, you don't mean four by 100, you mean 400? 400. Oh, weren't you dying at the end of that Least thing? Least favorite event I've ever done. Oh, it's like torture, it seems like. Super torture. You see these people starting out real happy and excited. <laughs> and when they come around, it's like the end of the world. The last hundred. Yeah, it's hard, right? It's super hard. Oh, so you graduate from high school, you're the guy, you know? Um, where do you end up in college? Florida A&M University. Okay. In Tallahassee, um, FAMU. So you're... Uh, getting the lay of the land at Florida A&M and you're going to play football the, your sophomore year. Um, are you home on summer break? Yes. And I'd like you to describe um, where you were living and what transpired that time period. When I was 17 years old, I moved out of my mom's house and I moved in with a buddy of mine whose dad was a pastor. And his, me and his son played sports together and we went to college together. So when I, naturally, when I was coming home on my college break, I was going to go back to the home that I left, which was with his dad. Mm -hmm. And so throughout that summer break, it was my freshman year in, high, or freshman year in college is when things began to spiral out of control. I, 
I never took, I didn't take anything serious. Um, everything was the party life. So I brought that home. I brought that back from college and I brought that back into the home environment that I was living in. And I think my, my buddy's dad, who was a pastor, um, who took great interest in both me and his son's life, recognized that. Mm. Um, now, had you, had you partied at the end of high school or did that pretty much start at college? It started at the end of high school. Okay. But through college was, was when it really, it, seven days a week. So your buddy's pastor, a uh, dad that you're living with, he's sensing something. Right. We come home on college break and he knows that that first year of college, um, that's what our life would consist of because that's what we brought home. And does your mom reach out to you and say, I want you to watch the house? Yeah, she we? calls me. She, my mother calls me and she wants to go on vacation. So she asked me if I'd watch her house for a week. And through this, you know, in a 19-year-old kid's mind who was about to watch a house to himself, I'm eager to get there. I'm frantically packing. Um, I'm ready to go. With the mindset that I had in college, with the mindset that I developed that I'm, I now have a house to myself, you know, sky's the limit mm -hmm. in my mind. And I think your friend's uh, dad, who's a pastor, says something to you right before that week. Absolutely. So I'm packing and I'm frantically packing. And I'll never forget it because he, he stone cold looked me in my eye. And as I'm packing, he says, I need to talk to you. I need to talk to you. And I look up at him and he says, don't make this be the worst week of your life. And of course, at that time, I look back at him and I said, I, I, this, my exact words were the worst week of my life. This might be the best week of my life. And he, you know, in a loving way, just backed off and said, okay. You're partying all week. You got the house to yourself, and I think you said it progressively gets worse and worse as the week goes on, mm -hmm. and you get approached by a couple guys. So these two guys are in the back of my mother's house who had gotten dropped off. Little did I know they were on the run from the police. Mm. And they were back in the back of my mom's house planning to commit a robbery, but they had no one to take them because they had gotten dropped off there. Um, so at this point, they stepped to me, and that's when they asked me, will you take us to this robbery? And having never done anything in my life like this, my first response was no, no. I will not take you to no robbery, no. And so then they look at me and they, they, they go to another buddy of mine who was on his college break, not the pastor's son, it was another buddy. And they said, man, will you, will, do you mind taking us to this robbery? And he looks up at him and he goes, I'll take you if Pons goes with us. Hmm. And so now all eyes are on me like, are you gonna go? And that they start hyping up the mood, come on, go with us. And lo and behold, being 19, I said, all right, I'll go, let's go. So what happens? We go to walk out and there's a fifth guy who I had not known, met, never met, sleeping on my mother's couch. And on the way out the door, they tap him and wake him up and they said, let's go. So four of us turn to five. We, us five getting out, there's three of us in the back seat, two in the front seat, and us five are on our way to a hotel to rob a drug dealer. I've never been anything like this, don't know what I'm doing, and I'm just I'm riding with them to do this. So we pull up to the hotel, three of us get out the back of the car, um, me and two other guys. When we walk up to the door, uh, the knock at the door, a fake name was given, and the guy opened the door. Immediately a fight breaks out. He swings a gun and they begin to fight. And so they're on the ground now at 19, never done this. I'm pulling the guy off saying, let's go. This has went bad, let's go. And I end up running back to the car. And so now we're just sitting in the car, sitting in the car, me and the two other guys. As I'm sitting there, sitting there, a few seconds go by and I hear a gunshot go off. As Soon as that gunshot goes off, I put my hand in my head and I begin to cry. They come running back to the car and we pull off. The guy that pulled the trigger says to the guy on the other side, he said, uh, I had to shoot the gun in the air to get him off you. I had to shoot the gun in the air to get him off you. So all five of us go our separate ways and that's all I'm thinking. A fight broke out, a guy shot the gun in the air. This, everything went bad. So six hours later, I get a knock at the front door and it's a detective. Hmm. He says, can I question you about a robbery? Yes, sir. I get in his car, no handcuffed, ride, drive to the precinct. And a few hours go by and I look at the detective. I said, I can tell you what I did, that's it. 
And so I began to explain. I said they were in the back of my mom's house. They planned a robbery. They asked me to go. I said no. I ended up going with them, got out the car, fight broke out, ran back to the car, and I heard a gunshot. And the detective said, stop. That's all I need to know. And he looks me in the eye again and says, you'll be charged with first degree murder and attempted murder. And at 19 years old, I'm standing there looking at this detective and telling me you're getting a first degree murder charge and attempted murder. And he says, I'll explain to you what happened. He says he didn't shoot the gun in the air. He shot the dude in the chest. The bullet went through the dude, killed him through a door and hit a girl. So all five of you will be charged with first degree murder and attempted murder. Because that's the law. In because Florida. that's the law in Florida. My jaw dropped burst out in tears. I began to cry and, and I knew that it was, it was the end right at that moment. What do you do now? Um, I assume you've probably never really had an attorney. Mm -hmm. um, what do you do? Who do you go to? In the Florida prison system or um, legal system, which is much like probably any state, if you don't have a lawyer, they appoint you a lawyer. Um, they give you a public defender. Um, they appointed me a public defender as my grandparents went and searched for a lawyer, you know, to find out what's going on. And initially I got a, a, a paid for attorney, um, but through a series of events that never worked out. So the court appointed me a street lawyer. How did they find you? So the, the guy who had never gotten out the car, the one that gave the directions to where this hotel would be, went to a, a friend of his house, a friend of his, and he's explaining to his buddy at his house what happened. Now it's all over the news, helicopters out. Her, uh, our, his buddy's uncle is listening through the door. And so he calls the police. So the police show up at his house and as soon as the guy leaves, they lay him down um, and he gives every single one of our names. So he knows you. Oh yeah, yeah. And so they come and pick us up one by one. So what happens to you? In the county jail, my first two weeks as I was incarcerated, I was broke. I was broke. Um, I didn't know what was going on. And one thing I never recognized up until this moment is when I started recognizing this is that God's hand was on my life. Never recognized this. As a little kid From with a little your kid grandparents to... To my buddy's dad who was a pastor. Yes. And I never recognized God's hand on my life until this moment. And I'm sitting in the county jail and and... I'll, I'll never forget this. This is where my life completely changed. A guy comes and talks to me about the Lord early in that day. And all I could do in my first two weeks was cry, eat, and sleep. Um, and he's like, man, I want to speak to you about the Lord. And I look in this dude's face and I said, I don't want to hear about God. I'm facing the rest of my life in prison. And I'm sitting in a D-508 in the county jail in, in Land Lakes, Florida. In the middle of the night, it's two o'clock in the morning. And I'm questioning, how did I end up in this spot in my life? And it hit me like a ton of bricks and it played like a movie in my mind. Every single time God tried to reach out to me in my life, every time. Remember when you were 16 years old and your grandparents gave you that Bible and you looked in their face and you smiled, but in your heart, you thought that was the lamest present you could ever get. God was saying, I was reaching out to you. Do you remember that Christian girl in high school that used to talk to you about God and you guys used to laugh at her? I was reaching out to you. Do you remember your buddy's dad who was a pastor that tried to sit you down and counsel you, but you didn't want to hear it? Do you remember in college that girl, every time God tried to reach out to me, played like a movie all the way up into the moment when he looked me in my eye and he said, don't make this be the worst week of your life. Mm. And it broke me down because I knew that I had lived a life rejecting God is why I sat in that position. And the very next morning, I cried myself to sleep. And the next morning, that same guy come back up to me. And he said, man, I, I don't mean any disrespect. I just want to speak to you about the Lord. And in my heart, that moment, this is why I, sometimes when I write my testimony, I get an opportunity. It's entitled do or die. Because in my heart in that moment, it was like the Lord was saying, do or die. You've rejected me your whole life. And I looked at the dude and I said, tell me, tell me. And he began to talk and I started to cry because I knew that that was the reason I was in that position. Mm. And my, from that moment on, my life changed. That was your moment of full surrender to Christ, full the Savior surrender. and Lord. So you have your newfound faith. Yeah. How do you apply that to this scenario? I knew I was in the county jail, didn't know when or if I was ever getting out again. I was clueless. 
So I just want, I, everything I did was I just wanted to know about the Lord. I just read, 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 um, and began to grow. Over the next course of months, I'm going to pretrial. The state's first offer to me, um, where I could see the light of day, was 20 years. Oh my. With 10 mandatory. So you do the first 10, and then you do 85% of the second 10. So that would have been eight and a half years. That was 18 and a half years in prison. And I knew I couldn't take 18 and a half years. So I kept denying the, the 20 years, kept denying it all the way up into trial. Mm. So the last visit in front of my lawyer, I said, I can't take 20. And so we started to argue. And uh, I, we, he jumped, he gets up to walk out and he turns around and, and I throw my hands up and I said, try for 15 years. What is it gonna hurt? And he says, they're not gonna give you 15 years. And so he walks out and it was a day of trial. Um, he, I hear my name called over to intercom for a lawyer visit. He comes in, slides a sheet of paper and he goes, they accepted 15 years. And I said, I'll take it. And then I believe it was December, 2005, I accepted a plea agreement for second degree murder and attempted murder with two 15 year sentences ran concurrent. So I was sentenced to 15 years in prison and you do 85% of that, you do 12 years, nine months. And uh, that's what I was sentenced to. Where do you um, become incarcerated for prison? Where do you go? So I went to Orlando Reception Center to get processed, to get a, a DC number, to get what permanent prison you'll be housed at. Um, and I did around three weeks at that reception center. I've never been incarcerated, spent 19 months in the county jail. Now I'm on my way to prison for the next almost 13 years. Um, Is there ever a moment when you hear the door slam and lock, that it, the weight of it all hits you? So my first three months incarcerated, I'll never forget, the gut-wrenching feeling of hearing walkie-talkies and cell bars in the middle of the night where you're used to having peaceful, pitch black, mm -hmm. no sound sleep. You could turn everything off and hear crickets. You're listening to walkie-talkies. That used to turn my stomach, rip my guts out to the point that I couldn't even watch the first 48 shows or anything to do with cops on TV because it would, it, the, the weight mm -hmm. of being in that. And so it took over a year for that to really wear off and realize that, you know, this is my environment. And a year. Yeah. But you begin to experience God's favor in prison. Uh, what was that? So moving into prison, um, I remember the first time, uh, I still remember, you have different jobs. You have job placements, right? When you get into prison. And I, you know, I'm just living for the Lord. I don't know what to expect from prison. And I'm going outside and, and a guy sees me, you know, walking the track and he walks up to me and he's like, man, there's a, a classification job opening up. Um, I'll consider you. I, I just, I'm, I'm watching how you carry yourself. And he's like, I'll talk to the classification supervisor. And lo and behold, um, that was my first crack and opportunity at God's favor within prison. So I became the classification orderly, um, which I cleaned the classification building. I assist in any way possible. Um, and just, li and just you know, conducting yourself as, people can tell the difference. Mm. They can tell the difference of uh, not perfection, but somebody who's serious yeah. and dedicated. Yeah. And I think that's what they recognized. Uh, and it began to open doors where you know, now I'm an orderly. You know, I'm, I'm brand new to prison. And when you get the title in prison of orderly, that's one of them things where um, you're, you're getting some of the best treatment. Mm -hmm. And that's where God's favor began for me. Mm -hmm. And that's where God began to position me in places that he was gonna start opening some awesome doors and meet some great people. Tell me how you awesome. met Andy Foster. Everybody knew of this Andy Foster and his administrative skills and, and all that. And so that got wind to Mr. Ellis, our classification supervisor. And one day he, he calls him in his office and he calls me in his office. And he's like, I want to start a GD program, an adult education program. And I want to use you two. 
And he handed him a language book and he handed me a math book. And I would never, I've never taught a day in my life. And I'm holding this math book like, <laughs> you know, what do I do? And I remember sta staring at Andy Foster in his classroom, not knowing what to do. And, 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 and immediately his administrative skills, he puts his hand to the plow. I open that book and we just went to work. And so we developed a relationship that we're teaching together we're ministering together and God's favor in this GD program starting off. Um, he got behind the computer and I like to say it like this. He, basically, he was handed the keys to the city. <laughs> Whatever you guys create, that's what we'll roll with. And so I play my role with, as an enthusiastic math teacher um, and God's favor just, you know, this is what you put in front of me. And so that's... Now, are you communicating who God is through the education or is that a, in a separate meeting? So we have an opportunity, um, and I, this was one of my philosophies in teaching. Uh, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. So GD was the opportunity to love people. Mm -hmm. It was an opportunity to, to care for them so that we can have an ear for the gospel back at the dorm, so that we can have an ear for the gospel when we're on the rec field or in the chapel or in the chow hall, because they knew we actually cared for them. Mm -hmm. I mean, so it, it, it married together and it extended through our teaching. We weren't necessarily preaching from um, our teaching right. moments, but we were using that as an opportunity to care. That was the bridge. That was the bridge. And it was also the catalyst for the favor, because then God started downloading in us a desire to want to do things like tracks, pass out tracks on the compound, write newsletters, and so now we're in proximity to computers, printers. And so now we're sharing this uh, idea with our classification supervisor who already is a man of God and has a heart for oh inmates. And he's like, sure, go ahead, write your tracks, type them up, write your newsletters. And so the favor's pouring on. So through our opportunity in GED, God is just building a way for us to minister the gospel in our daily living when we wake up. Amazing. Being amongst the guys, being with them, and just sharing the gospel on a day-to-day -day basis. That's amazing. That's like Joseph <sighs> in the Bible. So Andy gets out. You're having this amazing ministry, and Andy is released before you. Mm -hmm. And uh, does he make a promise to you? So while we were incarcerated, it just started swelling up in us that, you know, now we're looking at each other, and through this relationship, we're saying, we want to do this for the rest of our life. This is what we want to do. That was one of those God things that when Andy got out, he's like, we're going to stay in contact. So he put me on his phone. I put him on my phone list. And for, two, for twice a week, I called him and we spoke and we stayed in contact from 2011 to 2018. And, we, and he stayed involved in my life. Um, and I get a chance to talk to him. I was able to write because he, be, he continued the newsletters mm. exiting prison. And from within prison, I was able to still continue to write articles and share about the hope that I was maintaining even while I was incarcerated. And so, yes, um, through, verbal, through verbal communication, him telling me, um, through action, uh, the promise was evident in the... In, just doing it. When your day came, what happened? <laughs> so my day, March 27th, 2018. Oh, wow. Andy packs up his family, his wife, his two kids, traveling from Indiana, um, which there's a testimony to get into Indiana, um, and comes down on my release date. He joined my grandmother, my aunt, my grandfather, and I had grown some awesome relationships through the prison I was at. And I had buddies, moms and dads and a couple sets of families that were out there. Uh, the administration at the prison I was at at the time walked me out of the prison, which is unheard of. Mm -hmm. Wardens, assistant wardens, into the arms of Andy standing there with his kids wearing, I love Pons and Uncle Pons t-shirts. 
and it was an emotional time. I, 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 when I looked down, I see my aunt standing there who's going through dialysis, who wasn't supposed to be there. I look down and she's standing before me and I'm crying. They're crying. My grandparents are crying. The administration's crying. Um, and it just was a, you know, the, the moment we had talked about for seven years was now. And here you are now ministering to so many through uh, this incredible uh, ministry that takes place at the Cupbearer Cafe. Yeah. And uh, you're paying it forward, helping other people that are in the situation you were in, helping all kinds of yeah. people. Absolutely. And I just want to thank you for everything that you're doing for our community. Um, you've uh, you had contact with your mom. You've, you're maintaining that relationship. You're, you're living out the forgiveness and reconciliation that God has done with you. And you're just a, a portrait to me of God's restoration. And I just want to thank you for it. And thank you for sharing your testimony. Thank you, Mitch. And I really appreciate it. It's a privilege. It's a privilege. <laughs> thank you. First Corinthians 10, 13 says that all temptation is common to all of us. But when we are tempted, God is faithful and he will always provide a way out. A pastor told me one time, you can never be tempted unless you know what's right. I want you to think about that for a minute. You can't be tempted and you, unless you know what's right. Anthony has shared how God was faithful and always provided a doorway out, but he missed that doorway early on in his life and he's not missing it anymore. Maybe you're at a crossroads and you're tempted and you know what's right, you know what's wrong, you know the consequences and you're thinking about doing it anyway. I want you to know right now that the God of the universe is providing a doorway out. Whatever darkness you're in, that door has cracked light and it lights a pathway. There's a pathway illuminated right to your heart and you can take the first steps toward him and avoid that temptation and be free. Respond to the light and follow the pathway out to the God of the universe who loves you, designed you, and has a plan for your life and will make you new again and use you, like Anthony, to bring his restoration to others.